This is Sports and Torts with David Spada and Elliot Harris on TalkZone.com. Elliot, I was a little worried about our next guy because we were interrupting him when we were ready to interview him. He's a shopper for golf clubs. Former football players do. Exactly. They got nothing else to do. They made all that money. They figured, let's golf. But let's get right to Dermani Dawson. I see you went to college at Kentucky. Kentucky wasn't known back then as a big football school. How did you end up over there? Well, you know, uh, like all of us in high school, you know, we have somebody that we are uh, in love with, a girlfriend. And um, so I did. I was a year ahead of uh, my girlfriend at the time. So in order for us to be together, I went to uh, UK. Uh, because I, I wasn't going to potentially Michigan State or UCLA. And uh, I think she wanted to go to, um, I can't remember what college she wanted to go to. But I said the only way it's going to work out is if we both go to Kentucky. So that's how I ended up at the UK. And it worked out? Yeah, it did. It sure did. Uh, you know, yeah. we were, we were um, married for 23 and a half years and then got a divorce uh, a few years ago. I have one basic question. You're probably the only Hall of Famer, the only athlete with the first name of Dermonte. Where does that name come from? Well, you know, I was asking my mom that once before, and my aunt, uh, you know, my dad's uh, younger sister, she had, um, I guess, naming rights of uh, all the kids. And <laughs> so she was the biggest influence on my mom, and all my brothers, all of us, our initials are DD. Uh, I'm the oldest. Uh, Dermani Dawson and then Demarcus Dawson, he's four years younger. Uh, Deshaun Dawson is 10 years younger than I, born on the same day. And then I have another brother, De'Aaron Dawson, who is 11 years uh, younger. So all the initials are DD. I remember <laughs> reading in the late 80s when I was in high school about Kentucky's dorms being incredible with hot tubs in there and spas was like a resort. Was it just for the basketball players or did you guys get access to those too? No, we, we, the football team and track and baseball, we all stayed in the same dorm. Uh, you know, we stayed in Kerwin, uh, the low rise, Kerwin, um, uh, or, yeah, Kerwin, uh, uh, complex. And, and, but no, they did have a Wildcat Lodge, which, which was basically for the, uh, 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 basketball team. And, uh, yeah, you know, they had a pretty laid out, uh, little pad there, uh, on campus. But, uh, yeah, we weren't uh, privy to that. You did not play high school ball as a sophomore. How did you not get dragged by some coach to the playing field and said, son, you can go to college if you just get on the playing field and, uh, and hit the books so, at the same know, time? It, it all kind of happened. Uh, it kind of happened uh, kind of weird. I was just, um, you know, I did, I did play my ninth grade year. I was on the team, but I didn't play any games. and I was a practice dummy, basically, and I really didn't care too much for it. So, of course, after that, I said, well, no football for me. And um, so, you know, my junior year, or right before my junior year, uh, my high school football coach, well, he was just hired, Steve Parker. Um, he had just been hired as a new football coach uh, there at Bryan Station Senior High in Lexington. And I was coming out of chemistry or biology, either one. And, you know, he mistaken, he mistaken me for um, uh, an adult or, you know, one of the parents. Because he said, he said, sir, can I help you? And uh, I, said, well, I said, I uh, attend school here. And he said, huh. So he put his hands on my shoulders and said, where have you been all my life? And uh, he said, son, you need to play football. Uh, so he was the one who convinced me to, you know, to go out. And then he had two of my buddies who were on the track team with me, Mark Logan and Cornell Burbage, um, to convince me to go out and play uh, trial for football. So I did, and, uh, you know, the rest is history. And then, you know, my, my uh, two buddies, Mark Logan and, and Cornell Burbage, both of those guys played professional ball as well. How did you lose any games with that offensive line? How did we lose any games? Well, you know, we, we had a pretty, uh, we lost in the state at large uh, game uh, against Christian County. And then they went on after they beat us and uh, uh, won it all, won the state championship. But, uh, yeah, we, we had a pretty good team. It's just we were outmanned against Christian County because they had so many players uh, on this team. They had separate everything, separate special teams, uh, separate defense. Separate offense. I mean, they were like a college team when they came to our school to play us in the playoffs. Couldn't believe it. What was the transition like from high school to the Southeastern Conference football? Well, you know, I was redshirted as a freshman, um, you know, coming into UK. But the biggest difference that I see going from that I saw or experienced coming from um, high school to college was just the uh, 
the physical part of it, you know, because I wasn't, I was uh, about 250 pounds, but, you know, you have guys who are much larger and much stronger, much faster than you. Um, and, you know, making that transition because it was just a much faster and much more physical game than what it was in high school and much better athletes. So that was the difference, you know, making that transition and what I saw as a difference uh, coming out of high school and making that transition to college. And then you get drafted by the Steelers, and then you had to, what, back up Mike Webster, so they moved you to, what, guard your first year? Well, I was drafted originally as a guard, and so I ended up starting my fourth game of my rookie year um, uh, beside Mike Webster, and then I finished out the year at guard, and then halfway, I guess while during the offseason, um, after my uh, rookie year, Coach Noel came up to me and asked me to, he wanted to uh, try me at center, and have myself and Chuck Lanza, who was the third round draft choice in '88, behind me, um, to fight it out to see who was going to take over Mike's uh, position. So you know, we we battled it out in camp and mini camp, and uh, and then um, after training camp, I guess at a certain point to uh, training camp, I was ended up um, uh, you know named the starter. At any point, did you say to yourself, "I'm going to be taking Mike Webster's spot," or or did you not have time to think about that? Well, you know, really, you don't have time to think about it. Uh, you know, I think the media pretty much made more, uh, you know, fuss about it than I did. And, you know, because that was a big thing. I mean, you know, Mike was in his 16th year. And, of course, you know, Mike was a legend in Pittsburgh. And, you know, of course, that is big fields to shoe for any, uh, big, big shoes to feel for anybody. And um, so, but I really didn't put any pressure on myself. I just kept telling the media, I said, hey, I said, just give me time to learn the position and then, you know, just kind of go from there. Let me get settled in. Uh, and just kind of go from there. But I, no, I did not put any pressure on me at all because there's already enough pressure from everybody else. So why should I put pressure on myself? All I was going to do is say, learn the, learn the offense and, uh, you know, learn the center position and just go from there. When you were playing center for the Steelers, it was like a revolving door of quarterbacks. I mean, you had Cordell Stewart, you had Neil O'Donnell. It has to be tough on a center with all these different quarterbacks back there because don't they all want the ball a different way or if well you know I mean you know the the voice inflection for all quarterbacks is different but it's just something you kind of get used to used to the more you work with a guy and in position uh you know the way they like the ball delivered to them all that stuff yeah I mean it is a factor but you know really I mean you know that's that that's a kind of simple uh fix and really not a hard transition making uh the switch from one quarterback to another uh, as long as he knows how you snap it and, and you uh, accommodate him as well, uh, it's not it's not a big transition, uh, you know, to a new quarterback. What was the transition like having Chuck Noll as a coach? Oh, hey, I tell you what, Coach Noll was just, uh, you know, I look up to him in awe because of uh, you know who he was and what he accomplished as a coach, and you know, a very knowledgeable man about various subjects, and uh, you know, just 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 a great guy. You know, he was just one of those guys who. He had accomplished, uh, you know, everything football-wise uh, in his life. And um, I was just in awe and just uh, very, very proud that I had a chance to play under his uh, coaching for uh, four years. And then you went to Bill Cowher. What was he like? Well, you know, the difference. I always tell people the difference between uh, Coach Cowher and Coach Noel. Uh, you know, Coach Noel was, had, had already, you know, pretty much accomplished everything. And, you know, he was calm and relaxed and, I mean, he would get upset every once in a while and let you know his displeasure. But, you know, Coach Coward came in, and he was much younger at the time and uh, not too much older than I was at the time. Um, and, you know, he still had that fire in his belly uh, for the game. And not to say Coach Noel uh, didn't have that fire. But, you know, it was a different kind of, uh, you know, enthusiasm. And, you know, he was right in the mix with all the guys, running sprints, you know, right in the middle of a drill. Uh, you know, yelling and screaming and uh, just just into it. And, uh, I mean, he was a great coach to uh, to play for, and I had the pleasure of playing nine years for Coach Cowher. And uh, it was a pleasurable nine years, that's all I can say. You were one of the rare Steelers who has his uniform retired. Does that sound right? Well, they don't officially retire uh, uniforms, but it hasn't been worn since. So, you know, that's... that's uh, uh, a great honor for some for somebody not to have uh, worn my jersey uh, after I uh, finished. So um, you know that just says a lot about uh, you know the C organization and how you know they embrace guys who have done well over their career. And so yeah, I mean it, it, it's a big honor that nobody has worn my jersey. 
But I wouldn't I mean, be mad at some award. Yeah. But you look at the guys on that list, you know, Bradshaw, Franco Harris, Mike Webster, Jack Lambert, Jack Ham, Joe Green, Heinz Ward, uh, Gary Anderson. It's like, it's like a who's who of not just the Steelers, but of the NFL, some, some legendary names. It's just, yeah, I yeah. About you, yeah. It, it seems a little mind boggling. Well, you know, I mean, it's an honor just to be in that number, uh, you know, to have your, your number not distributed to another player. Um, and that just shows the respect that the Steelers have for the guys who have played for those guys and, and given it their all throughout their career. Um, and it's just a big honor for us as well, for those guys that have that much respect for us as players, uh, to not, uh, you know, reissue our jerseys uh, anymore. What was your favorite moment in the NFL? Do you have one? Uh, my favorite moment was, uh, you know, after we won that AFC championship game against uh, the Colts and uh, knew we were going to Super Bowl 30 because uh, that, was, that's a, that was always a dream was to, uh, you know, play in a Super Bowl. Even though we lost, I mean, hey, we, uh, uh, you know, we, um, we made it there. We just didn't accomplish uh, what we wanted by winning, but we made it there. After being in that Super Bowl, did you think, okay, well, we'll, we'll get back there again? Oh, yeah. I, I thought that we would uh, get back there. But, uh, you know, it's so hard. I mean, I don't care how well or how much success you have, uh, you know, one year or one season. You know, that's still no guarantee that with all those guys coming back that you're going to make it because you have so many different variables that uh, play a role in making it or not making it, uh, you know, whether it be the playoffs or the Super Bowl. Um but I was surprised that, you know, because we'd had a good little run there, uh, you know, in, in uh, the AFC Championship games. And, you know, we lost uh, two of them, then we finally won the one against the uh, Colts. And I thought we, we had a chance to uh, make another run. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. When you got the call that you got inducted in the Hall of Fame, what was that like? Uh, overwhelming uh, when I received the call. Um, well, actually, I didn't receive the call first. I found out on the selection show because uh, the, I guess the protocol was, you know, you need to be by your phone um, whatever time it is, you know, before, right, right before the show. And they usually would call you and let you know that you are, you made it as a uh, enshrinee or inductee. But this year, uh, I guess, or last year, I guess they didn't do that because I think, you know, people kind of leaked it out that they had made it before they even announced it on the show. So didn't find out until the selection show itself, you know, after Jack Butler, Name name uh, came out uh, when Mr. Perry was uh, uh, announcing the inductees, uh, and then my name came out. I was in just pure shock. I just couldn't believe it. And, uh, and then my phone just went put. I mean, it went haywire. Phone calls, text. It was a massive amount of uh, calls and texts that were coming in. Well, you know, to have two Steelers voted into the Hall of Fame the same year, you'd think it'd have to be the Steelers Hall of Fame and not the uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton. Well, I tell you what, Canton was special. I mean, it was great to see all the Steeler fans out there, and and uh, you know what it made it, it made it more special for Pittsburgh uh, is that you had four guys who were associated uh, with Pittsburgh in one way or another. You know, Curtis Martin and Chris Dolman as well, uh, and then myself and John Butler. And it was a ton of black and gold there uh, at the Hall of Fame uh, induction. Elvin Bethea gave this year's class a compliment. He said, "You know what?" I really enjoyed this year's class because they were classy about it. A couple of years ago, he said, a player during his uh, acceptance speech kept saying that I earned this. I earned this. Like, it was not an honor. Like, it was something that he expected. But he said this year's class, basically, were very humble, and he enjoyed that. Well, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not something that you deserve. It's, it, it's something that is, uh, you know, rewarded to you based on your play and, uh, you know, longevity and consistency, um, you know, and it's just, it's just an honor just to be, you know, named and enshrined in, in, in the NFL Pro Football Hall of Fame with some of these great players that I looked up to and, you know, some of the guys that I respect uh, to this day. And uh, it's, just a, it's just a great honor. Well, there had to be a few things more humbling than your first start at center with the Steelers. When you guys played the Browns and the Browns won fifty-one to nothing. Fifty-one to zip. Yes, I remember that game. Did you wonder what have I gotten myself into? Well, no, I didn't worry about that. You know, I mean, sometimes you just have those games that you just can't explain. Uh, you know, those lopsided losses that uh, there's no rhyme or reason why it happened, but it happened. But and you, you got them. You got them back though, right? Ten years later, it was forty-three yeah. to nothing. 
uh, 43 to nothing or 49 to nothing, I think it was. I can't remember. I think it's 43 to nothing. Yeah, but uh, it all comes back around. So are, you're not going to be selling your Hall of Fame jersey like Ricky Jackson was? <laughs> am, am I going to sell my Hall of Fame jersey? Not, Jack, yeah, Ricky Jackson had it on eBay <laughs> earlier this year. No, no, no. <laughs> that's what I was trying to figure out, why he was selling it. Yeah. You know, hey, that's a keepsake. That's something that you should never, ever, you know, you treat that like uh, gold. And, um, you know, you, you don't sell that stuff at I learned, all. I learned something from Willie Lanier that the number inside the jacket is the number you were inducted. Yes, yes, that's your number. And uh, I am number 269 of 273. Wow. Very, yeah, I'm number 269. And you got a compliment uh, yesterday during the Bears-Browns game. They were showing the center after he snapped the ball going the block, and they said that they learned that from Dermani Dawson because after he snapped the ball, he was the first one to go block somebody. Well, you know, it's kind of weird because when I was uh, in Cincinnati and coaching uh, uh, in Cincinnati and helping out, um, you know, some of the guys come up to me from college, some of the rookies, and they said, you know, our coach used to use uh, your tapes to kind of show us how to pull from the center position. So it's kind of flattering that, uh, you know, you see some of these guys, and I still, you know, still feel like I'm young, but, you know, here I am almost 50, and, you know, these guys are like in their 20s. And so now that really makes me feel old when those guys say, you know, we used to use your film to, uh, you know, our coach used to show uh, you playing to kind of teach us how to uh, uh, pull from the center position. But, I mean, it's flattering that they use your tape, uh, to kind of use as an example of what they want to do and what they want to accomplish in the offense. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a humbling uh, uh, experience and also, you know, an honor as well. Now, when you hung up your football cleats in 2000, how tempting was it to consider playing for another team? Uh, you know, I mean, it's always, it's always tough, you know, when you consider playing for another team. And uh, I think it's even tougher when it's not on your uh, accord, you know, when you decide to retire. You know, I had to retire due to an injury. And um, and even after the Steelers had to cut me, um, I still had some teams that knew my condition, and they said, "Hey, we're just we just want you to play on Sundays. We're not worried about training camp." And and I said, "Well, you know that's flattering, but I just don't think I can do it anymore." So I wasn't at the time going to move my family, and I didn't want to go through all the you know the pain and and all the stuff that I'd suffered with the uh, hamstring tendon. Uh, and to this day, my hamstring still hurt and ache. Uh, 24-7. So I didn't want to, uh, you know, have that be a burden on another team. I want to thank all our guests today, Wynn Lacey, Dermani Dawson, and Tony Dorsett. Another great job by Dave Olson behind the glass. I'm David Spade with Elliot Harris. Thanks for listening to Sports and Torts here on TalkZone.com.